Hi, my name is Chanel Hasten. I'm the Director of Outreach and Community Relations for the Alaka Alliance. We're excited to welcome our next speaker for the Sea Otter Science Symposium. I'm going to pass things off to Bob Bailey, who is our board president for the Alaka Alliance, to introduce Tristan. Thank you, Chanel, and thank you, Tristan, for being here this afternoon, and I'm really pleased about this. Yeah, as you notice, uh, there's a theme here today, and one of them is uh, it's actually under the umbrella of thinking globally, acting locally. And about, uh, well, maybe it was a year ago, I saw the report come through on a California kelp restoration strategy. And I read through it with interest because uh, obviously we're working on kelp further north up here in Oregon, but I think there's a lot to learn from the uh, effort in California to uh, get arms around the problem of the loss of kelp and to develop a strategy for returning kelp to uh, our near shore waters. So uh, I reached out to Tristan and uh, she agreed to, to um, give us a, an update, a report on the California kelp restoration strategy. And I think it fits nicely into thinking more regionally too about how we uh, think about restoring kelp and the various mechanisms for doing that. So Tristan received her BS from the University of California, Santa Cruz, where she majored in marine biology, minored in legal studies, received her MS degree in biology with an emphasis in ecology from San Diego State University in 2017, uh, becoming the first in her family to attend and complete college. And being that myself, I understand what, what that means to the family. So congratulations. She is Kelp Project Director with the Nature Conservancy California, where she leads projects to develop solutions in the protection and restoration of kelp forests locally and worldwide. And as with other speakers, Chanel is going to put into the uh, chat the links to that report and to uh, other information that's pertinent to uh, Tristan's talk. So Tr Tristan, thanks so much for uh, agreeing to be a speaker this afternoon, and I look forward to hearing what you have to say. Great, thank you so much for that introduction and for having me. I'm really excited to be here today. And um, can you hear me okay, first off? We can. And, and as soon as okay. you share screen, we will see your presentation too. Yes, I will. Oh, yes, I will share it on top of my, give me one second. There you go. Should be able to see that. Let's see what we can do here. All right. Are we good? There you go. Yep. We're good. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you all again for having me. Um, I had the privilege of being able to check into these uh, symposiums uh, last year and uh, the year prior, and I always left. Um, with a strong sense of excitement towards all the work that's happening um, outside of California's boundaries. Because sometimes we get kind of locked into the arbitrary lines on maps to where we should kind of think. And so I'm really excited to be here today and especially kind of come off the back of Tom's uh, great presentation where you'll see some of the synergies with what we're doing in Mendocino too. Um, I've had the great honor of being able to talk with Tom over the years, and that's definitely cultivated some of um, my personal thinking around this subject and kind of the impetus to build out. Um, so without further ado, I also want to start by acknowledging that I am sharing out the product of many people's uh, minds, bodies, and time. Um, it's really hard work to get your body in the cold water. So I just wanna give a shout out to all the divers out there and thank you for all the energy that you put in to get underwater. Um, and I'd also like to really acknowledge um, the folks that we work with really closely on the work I'll share out, which are uh, Grant Downey, one of our commercial uh, urchin divers, among many others, uh, Reef Check, the Department of Fish and Wildlife, Ocean Protection Council, and the Noyo Center for Marine Science, and many, many more. So jumping in. Overview, I'll just go over very quickly um, kelp loss, and then I kind of want to spend the focus of this talk um, digging a bit deeper into restoration techniques and how we're thinking about 
potentially reestablishing kelp in these areas and thinking through what we've done previously, what we already know, and what we can do to move the needle even further to accelerate kelp reforestation. So these are some of the projects I'll go over today. Um, just as a like personal background thing, I'm a diver. Um, I started diving in college. Um, it's a huge part and how I kind of perceive this uh, kelp forest world. And I had the um, great honor of being able to dive um, starting in about 2011. And uh, right after that time, I was just diving all the time. And I clocked like hundreds of dives within a couple years, just because it was like, go, 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 research dive, post-college, during college, all of it. So I got to dive in these like really, really beautiful ecosystems um, that, you know, the understanding was they were going to be there. And in 2014, that very quickly changed, right? Um, all the research that I was doing, which was predominantly marine protected area monitoring, all of a sudden shifted into continuing that long-term monitoring, but then focusing now on capturing what was changing in real time. So that included um, diving in Oregon and Washington for the sea star wasting and documenting that, um, changes in urchin behavior, and I want to also make a note that like this story comes out very eloquent when we talk about it now, but um, at the time, like we did not know how long this was going to last and how intense this disturbance event was going to be. So a couple years into this issue in 2016, 17, um, I was able to go up to the Aleutian archipelago and dive along that island chain. And what's interesting about this chain is it has gone, it's first off a 1200 mile um, archipelago, right? So really big area, but generally it had been um, undergoing these shifts between kelp forest state, urchin state, back and forth, back and forth. And the otter was really the linchpin in that system. And so um, with, you know, again, that like understanding that deforestation could happen in other places because of other things, I found that very uh, interesting to kind of push on a little bit because there were lessons to be learned, but there were also nuances to every place that you end up going to. And so when I moved in, uh, moved to Mendocino in 2018 to start my work with Reef Check, um, the story I knew from the Aleutians was like uncanny. It was just so familiar to me. And it was heartbreaking to know that I didn't know about this. I didn't know that this was happening, um, which kind of catalyzed in this like other dimension of this work as the communications public engagement component, which I'll get to later. Um, and so in Mendocino, this is a very similar story to what you heard from um, Dr. Rumrill this morning and from Tom just now, where you have this lush, beautiful bull kelp forest. The fish love it, mammals love it, we love it. Cultural, um, cultural value with abalone. Um, and then we also had urchin encrosion, right? We had urchin physically, purple native sea urchin moving into the near shore environment, um, eating kelp, eating everything they could find, including our meter tapes. Um, which believe it or not, they can get on there in like minutes and chew a little bit through your tape. So they're pretty active. Um, and so we started seeing these changes. The diver, as Tom mentioned, like diver community was like, something's up, you know, the commercial diving industry, like something's up. And so um, just after that time, we started to collect some more information. There were long-term uh, data sets in place from groups like Reef Check and Pisco and uh, the Department of Fish and Wildlife, were, which were incredibly valuable at the time to say that this is what was happening before and this is after. So again, leaning into that community science and involving others to get underwater. Um, on top of that, we also had um, aerial imagery telling us that um, in under a decade, we saw over 96% decline in kelp canopy cover in Mendocino and Sonoma counties. So by the late, just to kind of like think about that time span, I just uh, explained that was between 2014 and um, 2018, basically. So like really rapid catastrophic ecosystem loss. And so by the late 2010s, um, there was really this, this moment where 
I think many folks who thought it was going to go away, um, I, I think, and myself included, <laughs> kind of leaned more towards, I think we need to start considering a more active role in managing this ecosystem or play play a helping hand in recovering this system, um, especially in a place like Mendocino without any keystone predator redundancy. Um, the sunflower star was gone. Um, otters have been absent for a, a pretty decent amount of time. Um, and so it was in a very vulnerable state. So um, the goals of the work, I would say just like broad reaching goals that we're kind of poised to answer now are, we're, we're really interested in evaluating the efficiency of grazer suppression techniques. Um, and I'll talk about those techniques and kelp enhancement. And I'll also explain those techniques for restoration um, independently on their own, but also together in concert together. Um, and we really wanna ensure that these tools are tested under a, a robust study design so that we can actually learn with the science and other anecdotal and other valuable observations and the restoration component. Um, so kind of jumping now into some of the logistics, which is fun. Um, for those unfamiliar, Mendocino is pretty much like equidistant um, to Humble in San Francisco. Um, it's about five hours from the Oregon border. So it's still like nestled pretty far south, um, but it's a lot like Oregon too. Linear exposed open coastline, little coves, little access points. Um, but we do not have a marine lab, university, or dive shop. So in terms of the type of restoration we're able to do, many folks travel from outside the area to do work here. Um, and moving on, so restoration techniques. Um, so we kind of think about restoration, what we can do in like these three different buckets. One is monitoring. So this includes uh, an occup, or sorry, um, I'll, I'll get into UAV surveys in a sec. Um, so aerial imagery, looking at sunflower star reemergence and then subtital monitoring. Um, resetting the ecosystem, which includes recreational urchin culling and commercial hand harvest and urchin trapping. And reforestation, such as kelp, uh, kelp farm, kelp enhancement. So the, these three buckets really, again, mapping and monitoring is by using aerial and subtitle information, we know where kelp is, how much there is, and the historical dynamics, which we can use to make strategic decisions about where we do restoration and how we do it. For that second bucket, resetting the ecosystem, this is really um, developing the innovative tools to remove purple urchin from reef um, and thinking really pragmatically about how we do that, the frequency of how we do that, and where we do it. And lastly, reforesting, that is like if you clear a space, if you create space, do the seeds settle and do they grow? So um, this is, again, exploring like how we can just bolster the kelp abundance in the water and get them to a point where they can um, reach maturity to reproduce. OK, so bumping along, um, so just quick mapping and monitoring, um, I think this is a really cool bucket of work that my colleague Fianna Sakamano is leading. And this, again, is to understand like how much loss there was and where the strongholds of kelp um, exist. And this is in collaboration with UCLA, Woods Hole, Greater Fairlands Association, Hakai Institute, and more. So uh, again, researchers are in the process of exploring these different technologies and capabilities of aerial imagery to map the size, shape, and connectivity of these patches. And there are three kind of main um, uh, canopy data uh, types that you can kind of lean into, each with different capabilities. So um, Landsat, for example, this uh, coast-wide global scale, has a hundred meter resolution, right? So the pixel size is a lot bigger. Its ability to detect tiny things is not as good. Um, and I'll get into like that piece a little bit later with an exciting product to share with you guys. But the next one is uh, regional scale, so Planet Labs. Um, and this is this can be correlated with um, aerial surveys or planes. And then the last one is these local scale drone images. 
um, which are super fine scale. This is down to like three centimeter resolution. And these, uh, we've been using drones, I would say more often than not, to find these really tiny persistent kelp patches um, because some of the other resolutions don't actually pick up on the limited kelp availability. And with that too, the drone imagery used to take, um, we've been doing it for, I believe, four years now, and this has, sorry, three years, and in the past couple of years, it would take months to process this data, and um, just on the last cruise, they were able to actually do this in minutes, which has definitely changed the game on how we think about mapping uh, kelp canopies over time, and how quickly we can get that information. Okay, I know this is a lot of information. Um, so, I'm now going to kind of like shift gears and dig into some of the techniques or tools that we're specifically looking at in Mendocino. So one is recreational culling or crushing of urchin in the water. The second is the commercial hand harvest of purple urchin. So not crushing them in the water, but landing them, which is um, different than what Tom kind of explained just now in Oregon. Um, urchin trapping. So thinking about other ways of getting urchin out without divers going in, and then kelp enhancement. And so with all of these techniques and tools, we've been spending a lot of time this year thinking about how we can leverage all the different, um, all the different tools on top of each other, but also detect um, the signal from these individual tools in themselves, which is not necessarily the easiest thing to do in the ocean. But what we have attempted to do is kind of set up these sites where you have these different layered approaches. So at one site, we're looking at hand harvesting of urchin um, in a target location and then adding in kelp enhancement strategies. At another site, we're looking at urchin trapping and uh, recreational culling in two distinctive areas. And at another site, we're looking at hand harvesting of urchin and urchin trapping. And throughout the whole stretch of the coast, again, we have that um, aerial survey that I, I had discussed, you know, mapping kelp canopies over time. And then there's also subtitle monitoring from uh, research groups and a sunflower star bio blitz, which I'll tell you about. So these, this is kind of the mosaic of projects, I would say, that we're really kind of uh, focusing on for this year and looking to next year. So starting with recreational urchin culling, um, mentioned divers, people with their faces in the water were probably the first ones to notice that things were changing. Um, and so they were kind of the, the first responders to this kelp decline, at least in the Mendocino area. Um, and so this is just a group of folks that had met up at a beach in Mendocino a few years back. And that's Josh Russo, who is kind of the, the leader of the Waterman's Alliance or president of the Waterman's Alliance, who organized a lot of these um, initial campaign events. And so um, around the spring of 2018, um, what California did was kind of move the uh, personal limit, right? So if you have your recreational fishing license, um, you could typically get 35 purple urchin per day. By, um, I think it was like spring 2018, this number was bumped to 20 gallons per day and then became 40 gallons um, per day while in skin or scuba in these three counties. So this allowed the public to engage directly with urchin culling. Again, they had to land these urchin, not crush in the water um, throughout these three counties. Um, granted that they were not actually able to, they again had to land these um, and they had to have a fishing license, which wasn't terribly, um, terribly bad because a lot of these folks were participating in the abalone fishery as well when it was open. So um, kind of moving off of this thought, many folks were also like, you know, it's a lot of work, it's hard, it's difficult um, to get urchin physically out of the water um, and land them on shore. And so um, many folks were additionally interested in crushing urchin in the water, which um, an amendment came, I believe it was like a year after that, which allowed for one site in Mendocino and one site in 
uh, Monterey tankers where recreational divers could go out and physically smash urchin on the reef. And so this is a emergency regulation that the department opened, um, which has a sunset date of April 1st, 2024, I believe. So um, between now and then, what we're really trying to do is monitor the impact. So on this photo, you can kind of see um, the recreational folks recently put out some buoys, um, kind of marking out the site. And I put a little QR code up here if you would like to see the voluntary dive form that we have asked folks to fill out so we can understand what effort goes in these sites. Um, but this is basically um, the idea of how we're going to do this. We're going to look at the social dynamics, like our folks going in the water, but we're also going to look at the ecological response, so subtitle surveys, and then also aerial imagery to look at canopy, um, canopy resurgence. So that's kind of what we're working with at that site with recreational divers. Um, so more on that, I would say, in the coming years, but I think we're off to a pretty good start. Okay, um, next is commercial hand harvest. So I'd like to kind of just take a minute to go over this body of work um, and start by saying uh, the recreational component like started and really catalyzed this work. And, you know, within a year um, after that, we were talking about how to additionally um, work with the commercial diver industry who were also facing a commercial a fishery disaster for the red urchin fishery. So they were looking for ways to get involved as well. So the Ocean Protection Council uh, granted nearly half a million dollars to support bull kelp restoration at two sites. And you remember that map, um, one was uh, Albion, which we're still working at, and one is Noyo. Um, and this, in addition to, you know, again, doing this larger acre-wide scaled removal with commercial divers, it also represented this unprecedented collaboration, I would say, between state government, nonprofits, um, and the local communities and the commercial divers who were all impacted by this loss. So this is really a solid team effort, I would say. Um, and I don't want to get into it too deep. I don't think I have time, but um, I will say that ReefCheck did release this really nice report that you can um, that you can access on uh, the OPC website. And this body of work is also highlighted in our kelp, our global kelp restoration guidebook that you can read about here as well. Okay, so the whole concept here with uh, commercial removals and just any form of grazer suppression really, is to reduce the density of urchin in a one meter by one meter area down to less than two urchin per square meter so that kelp can have some, some air, right? And be able to actually grow and thrive. So this is kind of the concept that we are really um, working with. And I would say holds true for most grazer suppression um, methods. So what we did was first we went out and we mapped an area. Um, we put down a temporary uh, benthic cable or trail across the site so that we could actually uh, work it. And mind you that um, the ocean is really, really rough up here. And so we did need to kind of adjust our standards of like how to do this work. So what you're seeing is like a Mendo style version of uh, grazer suppression. Um, we then conducted baseline surveys of the system, sent divers to assigned locations to systematically start removing urchin, about four hours of underwater time. They then uh, came back to shore um, and hauled their catch back up. Then we had a group, uh, volunteers mostly, come out and do dockside collection. So kind of like what Tom was mentioning, cutting urchin open, what are they eating? How are they living? What are they doing? Um, that's what we had going on, which gave us some really incredible information on um, their health uh, across time and within the site itself and among the two different sites. Um, we also monitored poundage, right? Like how much urchin, how how many pounds of urchin were actually coming out of the system. And so that kind of captures like the, I would say first phase of, of that work. Um, and so in the first three months in 2020, what we ended up finding was, um, or what we were able to do more so is 
6,000 pounds of urchin were removed with um, 94 diver days. And in 2021, that we then entered a maintenance phase where we didn't have to do as much work to keep that site clear. So most of the work happened in this initial um, this initial chunk of time, but you still had to go back and maintain the site over time. Um, so in total, um, in Noyo, this is for the site in Noyo, um, 31,000 pounds roughly came out of the site, um, which is a lot of urgent. And Albion, which started a year later, um, 13,000 pounds roughly of urgent were removed in about five and a half months. So then we started to see, right? So after the urchin removals, we started to see what we would hope to see. And so purple urchin, um, this is, for those unfamiliar, we have on our um, y-axis, we have the number of per square meter. Um, so that's five, 10, and then before and after. So before is like before we started any removals, after is at like the stop of when we were doing data collection. So as you can see, the restoration site, big decline in purple urchin, but our control site, which was just across the way, um, didn't even like stay the same. It actually increased in urchin in the time we were working that site. Red urchin, um, a little, as you can see, the error bars are a little overlapped, um, but generally we saw at the restoration site, like a few more urchin over time. Uh, control site though, we did see a pretty strong increase. Um, and then bulk kelp, we saw um, a you know, marginally significant amount of bulk kelp in the restoration site. And the reason I'm saying marginally significant is the time scale, right? Like when you work in a, um, a system, especially like a terrestrial system and a fire happens, how long would you expect for that system to recover? Not a year, right? Like in a year, you might start seeing grass. So really, I think our expectations of recovery are really important to keep in mind here too, which um, kind of leads me out of uh, commercial hand harvest, which was after the um, about year and a half process that we were understanding how this tool can be used, we also understood that it's challenging and we need to do more of it over time to really get down to like, what does it take to actually restore the forest? So um, I know I kind of dug in a little bit there, but I really um, suggest that you check out that document that I mentioned earlier and to read the full report and the findings and dig in more to some of that work. Um, okay, so kind of moving on. Oh, one last thing here too. Um, so hand harvesting again is continuing through this year and now we're layering on other tools. So moving on to one of those tools is urchin traps. And so urchin traps are really the test methodologies that don't necessarily require a diver to get in the water. And we really want to maximize our catch per unit effort um, to understand the effectiveness of this tool for restoration. And the concept is we have one site, which is Noyo, which has a reduced urchin density. There's still urchin on that site, but it's less than a control site or a heavily impacted site. Um, and so we're testing traps at a site like that. And then we're also testing traps at a site where there is no grazer suppression. So it's just full on urchin party all the time. Um, so moving on off that, um, again, the idea is to not only understand like how these traps are working when you look at their catch, but a big question mark is like, how do these, how do these traps actually work when you don't understand the density of urchin around them or the context, right? So this year um, we partnered with Reef Check and what was incredible was we were able to, well, Grant first, the, the fisher um, got, really incredible information on the traps, where he was putting them, super detailed, puts them in the water. Within minutes, the reef check divers are on the site, um, getting the information of like urchin density on the trap and also radiating spokes off the trap so we can understand localized density around that. Um, and then after our prescribed soak time, which is about 24 hours, Reef check divers went back in, monitored the after, and then Grant would pull up the traps and count all the urchin on the trap. And then we had that whole dockside process that I explained for commercial hand harvest happening off those traps as well. 
So to kind of see some of that in action, um, that was granite kind of throwing it in the water. You can see some divers swimming around, but this is minutes, right? Like within minutes, look how quickly the urchin are moving. Um, you know, some moving closer to the trap from under the trap. Um, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty incredible to watch how quickly urchin move. But last year we focused mostly on baits like fish and kelp um, and produce and different soak times. And just generally if these traps would work um, in the system without floating away. And this year, again, we focused on um, two sites with different urchin densities, so different contexts, with the same 24 hour soak and uh, kelp. We, we predominantly use kelp as drift or drift kelp as bait. Um, which I will also mention urchin do not eat most all of it. It just kind of goes, um, they'll take like little bites and then Grant was able to put it back in the water. So um, this is kind of urchin trapping. And so we just like literally last week finished up our field experiments. Um, but just quickly looking at um, these three time periods for this year, this is all the top side collection. So everything Grant counted. Um, and so number of urchin kind of low in winter. Um, as you can see, Casper, which is that site that had a higher urchin density, we're catching more urchin as opposed to Noyo. And you'll also see like a pretty strong increase um, in uh, summertime. And we started putting more bait and um, by more bait, bait, I mean like spatially distributing it on the traps as well. So that also helped us lean into a higher catch per unit effort for these traps. Um, we have a ton more data that we're still working through. So I'd be happy to share that out when it is available. Okay, um, kelp enhancement. And I know I'm running up on time here, so I'll try and blast through here. Um, so health enhancement, this is a ongoing um, collaboration work that is led by Moss Landing Marine Labs, um, partnered with others. But this was also leveraged, similar to trapping, this is also leveraging ongoing investments at, um, at some of the sites where hand harvest was happening. So at Albion specifically, um, you know, kind of the same setup as before, you have a site where kelp enhancement is happening and grazer suppression is being targeted, right? So commercial guys are working in the same spot, hitting it twice a month, um, super solid removal efforts, um, trying to keep that spot clear. And then they have the same kelp enhancement strategies being tested in a control site where there's no grazer suppression. And as you would expect, um, things get munched in the control site um, and things do marginally okay in the grazer suppression site. So the different types of uh, methods that are being tested are um, there's green gravel, right? So inoculating rocks with um, tiny little baby kelps with hopes that they grow. There's also putting them in rock or sorry, in bags. Um, there's also sporophyte outplanting and a few other methods. And Moss Landing will be able to share that out, I would say in the next couple months too. So I would keep an ear to the ground, but generally, um, it's just really exciting to now start thinking about not only grazer suppression um, as a tool for restoring kelp, but also um, just farming the farming the water, right? Like thinking about ways where you can actually cultivate kelp um, or accelerate its recovery. Okay, um, and we're coming close. So one more I want to just flag is sunflower stars. Um, as many have and I think this is most acute in California too, um, we have not seen a star, I, I believe like in near shore waters since at least 2014. Um, and in December of this past year, almost a year ago, someone was just walking around on the cliffs and saw like three beautiful adult healthy sunflower stars. And it was, uh, they took photos of it, it was confirmed, it was legit. And this was at a king tide in the inner tidal. And we're like, no way, like there are stars out there. So um, right after that, it was like hitting the king tides, going to every tide pool. And um, that kind of spun up this idea to do a citizen science project with a local nonprofit, Noyo Center, to go to as many sites as they could. So they went to seven sites um, at super, super low tides to look for sunflower stars. 
The information was uploaded to iNaturalist and the UC Santa Cruz Marine website so that they could track track that. Um, and unfortunately, they didn't find any stars, but that was also a data point, right? Um, and in addition to that, we also built a constituency of folks who started to become apex predator lovers and they became really good at some, like sea star identification and stewardship of the tide pools to understand like who was there and who wasn't so um so just kind of like floating this to that community science like really does build not only like the data collection process but it's also it's the community aspect and i would say that trend held true with all the different projects i i just kind of went over um, and so, you know, in summary, I'd say there's this emerging need to collaborate more directly across uh, these projects in Mendocino and beyond to achieve these project goals. Um, and I do spend quite a bit of time talking with other like folks locally and beyond to understand, like, what are we missing? What can we do better? Where can we kind of like harmonize our efforts? So to kind of bring us back here. Um, you know, in the next year, I'd say we're really leveraging these ongoing efforts, these ongoing investments in like the people and the time to really layer on like more tools and just take us like that next step further. Because frankly, um, I can't even say like one type of um, restoration tool would work well at Noyo as it would at Casper, nor would I say um, it would work in Mendocino as it would to Oregon. So it's not a one size fits all, but we can learn something. And I think another like another thing to think about too is it's a sliding scale, right? It's not, um, when you enter these systems, it's not just a scorched earth scenario. And when you think about like the recovery of a place, um, many could say like most of the damage, like the heavy damage was done um, from 2014 to 19. And then we started to see like a small increase in kelp from 2020 to 2021. And so this system is not static. And, you know, leaning into this year, um, some sites have maintained as, as you can see here, like some sites have maintained as an urchin barren. Other sites have started to see some kelp recovery, but urchin moved back in and started eating them. Um, at other sites, they're like just now getting to some of the understory as some sites, you don't really have purple urchin, but for some reason you have no kelp. And then at other sites you have like a pretty lush, beautiful kelp forest. So it's really like this sliding scale and it's complicated. And I think this is where we do need to, again, like think about other ways of understanding how these systems work in real time and not waiting um, years to actually understand how they work. So one kind of like parting thought, and this is where like I think our minds have been circulating this year a lot, at least where mine has, is um, thinking about like what we have available to us in this year that we didn't have in previous years. So as I mentioned earlier, drones, right? Um, this tool, um, I'll, I'll just tell you a quick little story. Um, so this year, super fine drone imagery saw slightly less kelp this year in 2022 as 2020 and 2021. So we saw like a pause in that upward trajectory. Um, so Vienna, who, who runs like the aerial um, monitoring work and Nora, the kelp strategy lead and myself like sat down and looked at one of these sites that um, that Vienna had made. And this is, this is one of the sites. And she made this map in like minutes, I'm like no way like I was salivating because this is stuff that like a diver dreams about, you know, having this sort of um, intel of where the kelp is. You're always standing on a cliff looking and being like, I think it was there last year, but this was like, you know, solid. Um, so then we found on top of that, we were like, okay, where's the spot that is like the kelpiest, most amazing, persistent spot. And we put this spot here. And then about three days later, I got in the water and was able to dive on that point and then do these like uh, surveys where I captured um, substrate and regossi, community composition, like the works. And this all, like all of what I'm explaining kind of happened in one week time, which typically um, 
you know, it would take months for the map and then, you know, few days, months to like get in the water. This was like within a week. So why I'm saying this is um, this, I think, puts us in this new scape where we're able to potentially um, do some predictive planning for restoration and understand what treatments each site may need for the following year. And kind of pin down the question of, can we actually even plan for next year? Or does the system just like throw us off um, with all the planning and we're like, actually it does something totally different the next year. But anyways, it, it kind of helps um, to understand what you're kind of going into for the following year or even anticipate what kind of restoration might be most effective. So um, so in the last couple minutes, uh, I just want to share out like some stuff for you to check out um, if you're interested in kind of following this Kelpie, um, Kelpie story. So first is uh, the Kelp Restoration Guidebook. Um, this was released in April, and it was a highly collaborative effort that brought together over 50 authors from 45 institutions um, from nearly every um, uh, nearly every continent. And it is great. It has um, how to kind of get started with kelp restoration, lessons learned, just a deep dive. And then in the back of the document, there are these case studies that you can look to see, like, why did each of these places need to do kelp? What, who did it? All of those things. So um, I suggest you check it out. It's really fun. On top of that, we have a website called the Kelp Forest Alliance which is a place where if you are a kelp restoration practitioner, you can access this and um, register your restoration project and become part of this global effort to understand like who's doing what techniques, where, where are they running into trouble, where are they successful, that, and even just meet people. Um, so you can register here or find out more about the work here. And the global guidebook is also housed on this website. Um, one more is uh, kelpwatch.org, um, which this is what I was mentioning with Landsat imagery. So it's that 100 meter resolution, so big pixels. Um, but it's a coastwide web tool that shows changes of kelp forest dynamics from 1984 to uh, 2021 so far and kind of building into the years coming up. Um, so it's the world's largest open source dynamic map of kelp forest canopies. And as you can see, you can kind of select an area, download data, um, and this is all available to you for, for use. So I strongly suggest you check it out. Um, this is just a little video of the Excel you can see. So pretty awesome stuff. Um, one more is if you are in the Bay Area, there's this uh, kelp exhibit where it's literally called Kelp, where it's showcasing a bunch of um, beautiful artworks by these very talented women. Um, Josie Island's work is on the right side and many others. And I would strongly suggest checking it out if you have the chance. Um, and I'll just, I'll get back to that if folks have questions. Um, the last one, okay, so I talked about a ton of just like restoration projects, techniques, all of those things. Um, but on the back end, right, is like, how do we how do we create solutions like everything that we're doing? How do we create solutions that work for both people and nature? And we need to develop the infrastructure, frankly, to make restoration of kelp forests just like part of our existence, part of our everyday activities. So I can't emphasize enough, like everything Tom said at the end of his um, end of his talk, which is like that workforce building, building communities to successfully like tend their gardens, I think is like where we're leaning. So um, we spend quite a bit of time like trying to find, um, you know, uses for urchin, not only for food, but also for other, other uses. Um, and so more on that too, but, you know, I think this is like a, that's probably like the slow to grow process that really needs some cultivation and some um, some energy. Okay, so with that, um, again, I just really want to flag like all the incredible folks that have put their like time and energy and thought behind like everything that I just shared. Um, I was just speaking on behalf of all these folks. Um, so thank you, everyone. If um, you're here, thank you for all the work that you did to help with this presentation. Um, and I will end there. Thank you.
Amazing job, Tristan. Thank you. That was fantastic. I learned so much. Um, let's see here. Okay. Uh, well, we do have lots of questions for you. Cool. And um, so several people have said uh, they did not hear you mention sea otters reintroduction as a possible strategy. Um, so what are your thoughts on sea otter reintroduction and kelp forest restoration? Yes. Um, that's, you know, I was like ready to, I, I knew that question was coming, you know, like you have to, and <laughs> like, I think the first, the first thing I'll say is in Mendocino, um, we, okay, so Mendocino is like right in the middle of Northern California, I would say there's a population of otter, like our closest population, I would say of otters are like the San Francisco Bay area, maybe Tamales Bay, someone on the chat, please correct me if you know otherwise, but um, there has been like one transient male that has moved from like, um, like up to Fort Ross, I believe, and then like moved back down, but never established. So the reason I'm bringing that up is like, I personally believe like, you know, otters deserve to be here. Like we, we exterminated them from the region. Um, they have every right to inhabit these waters. Um, in terms of like, physically being the person to come in and translocate them in this area, I think it's too soon. Um, I, th I think it's a little premature given, you know, how um, rough the ecosystem is right now. And also the Northern California, Northern California coast does not have a lot of refuge. It's not, um, it's not like we have a ton of estuary environments or places where otters can kind of like duck in and be safe. So I think, um, you know, there's kind of that writing that line between like efficacy of kind of putting an otter in that situation at this moment. Um, if they were to swim up north, I think that's a different question. Um, I think there's like kind of two ways I think about it. It's like the otter naturally kind of moving in the system and us like facilitating that that move on its own or us having the hand in like physically putting the otter in this space. So with that latter one, um, I do not believe it's like the right time to do that, um, given how delicate the system is. But at the same time, I think it's keeping an open mind for whatever the, the future holds for us. Thanks. Uh, just for update, uh, the closest sea otter population is south of San Francisco Bay and Pigeon Point, Half Moon Bay. That's a, FYI. Well, that's a far swim for that otter then. Yeah. Um, okay, we've got a couple more questions. Um, Ashley said, thanks, Tristan. Amazing update of the huge collaboration work um, being done in Northern California. Would you suggest logging sea star observation in iNaturalist and or the marine sea star wasting map? Ooh, great question. So we originally wanted folks to just do the UCSC marine pearl because they're the ones who have been tracking um, the sea star observations. But what we found was folks were just on their own using INAT anyways. Um, so it automatically uploaded their, um, their findings. So what we've done is we've now partnered with Cal Academy of Sciences so that we can have an alert anytime anyone uploads like a sunflower star in California to INAT. Um, that info is pinged over to us and other folks kind of like tracking um, sunflower star resurgence. So to answer your question, you can do both. Great. Thank you. Uh, Jim asks, how did the kelp forest near California current sea otters survive the sea star wasting disease and the marine heat wave? Sorry, it cut out for one second. Um, okay. Is this, how did kelp forest near... California otters survive sea star wasting in the marine heat wave? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, that's a great, you know, that's the million dollar question, <laughs> frankly. Um, you know, honestly, though, having that last piece that I was telling you about, like those persistent kelp patches, um, when I'm speaking to Northern California, and we don't have any otters, the you know, if, if we were thinking about like otters and persistent kelp, we'd be talking about Monterey, but 
up here, um, we have bull kelp, which is again, the same as organ. And so the life history characteristics of like that bull kelp surviving um, is also kind of playing into why the recovery is so complicated. Um, and then kind of like shifting over into Monterey, you have, and I think maybe getting at your question, in Monterey, you have the giant kelp, which is a perennial. So it's able to kind of reproduce all year long. Um, so that definitely like plays into its life history strategy, survivorship, et cetera. Um, and yeah, I would say, you know, some places, like some small places survived and Josh Smith's work found you have like a uh, kelp forest, for example, and the otters will feed just that, that line like around the kelp forest and then not kind of work in the barren. So I don't know if I'm necessarily answering your question other than to say like, that is like the question we're looking to answer now is like, why do some kelp patches do better than others? Is it is it topography? Is it location? Is it the species? Um, like, what is it about it that makes like those spots like so valuable? And what can we do to like really protect those spots in the future? Awesome answer. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, okay, Andy asks, does it seem inappropriate to conflate true ecosystem restoration with schemes to turn a profit off the work? I know it's tempting to find economic gains to offset costs, but wouldn't we gain more value from restoring the system than immediately trying to tie restoration to commercial enterprise as per Ralph's um, keynote earlier today? And what are your thoughts on that? Yes. Um, was I might need that one looped sorry, back. Sorry, sorry no. I was trying to find it so I could track. Um, it's okay. It Do you want question. me here? I'll, I'll copy and paste it to you. I don't yeah, know. It'd be lovely. Um, the question. Yeah, no, that that's such a good question. It's like a, the ultimate. Oh, okay, got it. Um, yes, it does. It does. Like on a personal level, um, I think where I, I've kind of like hit a wall with kind of that, that piece of like true ecosystem restoration and then like maybe schemes to turn a profit off the work, like kind of thinking about those two together. Um, I think it comes down to like who is doing the work to restore these places and they still need to put food on their table. I think that's, that's like where we've been operating is like the workforce that needs to actually get paid that day to get in the water to do some of that work. And I don't think we have a very clean way at all of understanding like how that system is actually gonna work yet, like how to actually tie in like the human dimension into like the restoration sphere and then tie in like payment into that. Like, you know, it's, it's not clean yet. I don't think we have it figured out, but I will say, like in a community like where I live, which is, I, I live in Fort Bragg, um, which is like kind of the heart of where this is all going down and maybe the closest city in between, like there aren't a lot of um, opportunities outside of kind of working in in the space. And so when the ecosystem collapsed, um, the, sh the town really shifted in like what they do. Like a lot of people changed what they do for a living. A lot of businesses closed. Um, and I know that's not like the, the soul being behind like the intrinsic losses of these places, but it's also, I think in some way we're, we're tied in, right? Like our, our want and desire to restore a kelp forest fundamentally is because we value a, just as a society, like we value kelp and all the ecosystem that it provides as opposed to a, a source like devoid of it. So I think in some ways, I know this is like another unsatisfying answer, but um, I agree. Like, I, I think like making a profit off the work, um, I think that's really tough. But at the same time, like there are folks that are have changed how they do business, how they do work so that they can now participate in restoration um, and they're our biggest proponents. So um, yeah, I, I don't think I answered your question very well, but um, it's a really good one. Thanks, I know that was a heavy one. 
Um, well, we've got five minutes before we switch over to our next presentation. So uh, if there's any last things you want to leave us with, Tristan, please do. If not, let us know. <laughs> yeah, um, no, I think the, the only thing I'll say is um, this is all kind of a work in progress, you know, and I just really want to also emphasize we are not the only community facing these these challenges. Um, even in the past years, like I start, I, I met Tom Calvinese like out of this body of work. And as we were starting to spin up the Mendocino stuff, it's like, hey, how you guys doing up there? And then you kind of asked down south and, you know, Rietta from Greater Farallon, she's like running the snow work. It's like, hey, how's it going down there? And then you bump over to Australia. It's like, how's it going there? So anyways, I, I think what I'm trying to say is like, there are, a lot of communities facing the same general challenge but I think it does take that like local finesse and those like local heroes that are willing to kind of really embrace understanding like what the community needs like at that moment but also like there are people that are left out of the conversation and I think we all need to do better at that so um yeah I just say like keep a global perspective to some of this work but also really value the insight of people who like live and work and breathe on the ground. They're like, they are what makes a lot of this work happen. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much, Tristan. That was, that was great. That was uh, more than I had hoped for. So thank you so much for the presentation and the work that you're doing in, in, with so many others.